And right on target now, we will turn to a very new area, which um, in one sense isn't uh, as new as it might seem, um, but what um, is called ctDNA or the footprints of the tumor uh, genetic structure that can be followed in the blood and measured in the tumor itself is something that Melissa Wilson, um, our lead PA in the Outpatient Melanoma Center will discuss. Melissa, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kirkwood. So good morning, everybody. Um, it's nice to see everyone virtually on here. As Dr. Kirkwood said, I am one of the physician assistants um, in the Melanoma Center. I've actually been with our center since 2005. So I'm, I'm the old dog in this clan. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about ctDNA because of the amount of time. Um, it's going to be a very, very long overview. Um, we're not going to spend a ton of time, you know, talking about the details, but you'll see ctDNA is something that I think is going to become extremely important moving forward with monitoring, especially. So um, let me just share my screen here and then we will um, get started. So what is ctDNA and how is it helpful to us in particularly in melanoma in this setting? So ctDNA stands for circulating tumor DNA. Um, and remember that it's the DNA that comes from cancer cells or tumors um, and that all cells, even cancerous ones, have DNA in their nucleus. And so what this test does um, is it, it identifies cancer-related genetic changes in the DNA from tumor cells that are released into the blood. And I have another, like my next slide shows how that gets released. Um, ctDNA has also been called a liquid biopsy. Um, although it can be um, obtained by a lot of the other bodily fluids like cerebral spinal fluid and saliva. Um, it is extremely effective in monitoring with a blood sample. Um, most oftentimes uh, the blood sample is just a couple of tubes. Um, so it really doesn't require a lot of blood. Um, how does the ctDNA get into the bloodstream? Um, well, most of the DNA is inside the cell's nucleus. But as the tumor cell grows, um, some of those cells actually do die, as all cells do, um, and they are released into the um, bloodstream as they're replaced by new ones. So these dead cells get broken down and their contents, including their DNA, um, get kind of spilled into the bloodstream. And you can see um, from this graphic sort of a visual perception of how that happens. Come on, little computer. There we go. Um, so what are the benefits to ctDNA? Um, it can um, give us some potential tumor information, um, especially in instances where a tumor isn't available for biopsy. So um, historically, um, ctDNA isn't a new thing. Um, it's been around for a, a while. Um, and originally, it was really good at genetic profiling. So um, in patients that say, in our case, we wanted to have BRAF testing for, um, in patients that unfortunately didn't have tumor, didn't have enough tumor in their original biopsy, or maybe didn't have a tumor that could be biopsied, um, doing a liquid biopsy or doing ctDNA could tell you a little bit about the tumor from a genetic or molecular standpoint. Um, also, obviously, there's a benefit because it's a blood draw with very little blood, just a couple of tubes. Um, some more advanced benefits are that you can identify clones of tumor, you can measure um, and track minimal residual disease. So this would be applicable for patients that um, were thought to have a complete response or were resected or for patients like um, uveal melanoma um, after you have either radiation or an enucleation um, for monitoring for recurrence um, with circulating tumor DNA, even prior to it being clinically or radiographically um, apparent. So some really exciting applications. Um, this has been extensively tested in many of other solid tumors like um, colon cancer and head and neck, renal cell, ovarian. Um, we're just really starting to get to the meat of potato potatoes and using it for melanoma. Some of the limitations um, are that if tumor isn't present, you might ha not have ctDNA detected in the bloodstream um, to get the wanted information. So this is referring to, you know, if we want to get BRAF results, if you don't have any ctDNA that can be detected, we may not be able to get a BRAF result from your um, 
from your blood. Um, also mutation results like genetic information, next generation sequencing, things like that. Um, sometimes the tumor may not be shedding enough cells to be detective and or detected. And this could lead to false negatives. This has been proven in some of the earlier um, studies. Um, for any kind of meaningful immunotherapy monitoring, which is what we're in our specific clinic are starting to try to use this for as a companion test, um, you need to have multiple time points drawn. So um, ideally, we would like to draw this at baseline before you start treatment and then at several time points, usually about 12 weeks with scans um, throughout treatment to kind of see you know, what the trend of, of the level of ctDNA is. Um, and also at this point um, for melanoma, um, there really isn't enough data to use as a screening or monitoring tool yet. So we're working on that. There are multiple ongoing clinical trials that are available um, that you know, are monitoring this in our particular clinic. Um, we are trying to get a lot of data for this, especially with immunotherapy patients now. Um, so the take home message about ctDNA right now is that we shouldn't use this in place of a tissue biopsy or scans really for making decision making tools, but it is a great resource for as a companion test. Um, what has been done with ctDNA and melanoma? Um, obviously, we've talked earlier about um, it can identify mutations like BRAF and RAS TERT, etc. Um, you can use it for tumor profiling. Um, like mutational burden, local tumor environment. Um, some trials have actually already shown ctDNA um, detection of BRAF in the blood prior to the clinical development of tumor um, in an adjuvant setting. Um, and this was done with Middleton et al. And so you can actually detect in this particular trial, it showed that um, patients with the BRAF mutation, um, you could actually identify it be rough in the blood with ctDNA prior to scans showing um, tumor. Um, and also um, ctDNA is being used as a monitoring tool in response to immunotherapy. Um, and it has been established. Um, there is a company that actually has this indication as part of their FDA approval. So here is a graphic, it's a little hard to see, and I wish I had a pointer to be able to show you where I'm referring to, but as you can see on the graphic to the left, um, the first sort of picture with the person with their hands above their head shows lots and lots of tumor, um, and that corresponds to a ctDNA level that was quite high. And in this particular case, um, in the second picture over from the left, um, that patient had a very significant response to their tumor um, radiographically. And you can see the ctDNA in the bloodstream actually went down to zero or undetectable. Um, the same type of response can be seen with immunotherapy. In this case, um, the patient was then treated um, with ipilimumab and they went from a um, undetectable ctDNA to some detection of their uh, ctDNA in the blood and radiographically, they did see this lymph node, a couple of lymph nodes actually, but this lymph node, um, underneath the left arm. Um, and then as they were treated, um, you can see their ctDNA levels sort of bump all around until progression of disease. So while, um, this is a great tool to use in adjunct to scans. Um, right now, we can't just do ctDNA testing and know whether or not your tumor is back for sure. So it's something that obviously warrants further testing in the future. So how can we use this in melanoma moving forward? Um, what we're you know, trying to kind of establish is an ability to help monitor patients. And especially this is important in people who um, with immunotherapy may have what's called a um, pseudo progression. And so what we're trying to do is get a baseline draw and then draw again around each restaging assessment. Um, this, these results come back pretty quickly once the baseline assessment is done. So um, in our particular mm -hmm. clinic, um, I've been trying to draw patients like one, one visit earlier, right before they get their scans so that by the time they have their scans and they're seen in clinic, we actually have these results to sort of draw upon. Um, it can help identify quantitatively the tumor that may not quite be responding yet on imaging. So what that means is 
we just had a specific patient who radiographically looked extremely stable, um, but their CT DNA levels actually dropped quite significantly um, from their baseline level to their first staging assessment. And so while we didn't make any significant conclusions on that right now, because obviously this is still in, you know, the figuring it out stage. Um, it, it's helpful information to know that we are making some type of impact, at least on the quantitative tumor that's circulating around. Um, and as I said earlier, we can, or it has been shown in the past to um, show progression earlier. Um, so those are important kind of prognostic things that we can draw from ctDNA. Um, the other thing that I think will be useful in the future um, for ctDNA is to monitor patients post-surgically or post-treatment response. Um, so this would be applicable to patients who, you know, or maybe stage three or had stage four disease with a solitary tumor that was resected, um, where we, you know, draw ctDNA, they don't have any um, quantitative um, disease at baseline. And then during the course of monitoring adjuvantly, um, they develop a level, an elevated level that would prompt us to do scans um, <clears throat> and investigate that further. Um, we could also potentially detect recurrence um, following complete response. So in the patients that, you know, have a complete response to either targeted or immunotherapy, and we stop treatment and then are monitoring these patients with scans, we also could do ctDNA along with that to kind of look a little bit more closely. Um, I kind of talked about these already. So um, detection of measured residual disease, um, screening for recurrence and metastasis, helping to interpret between pseudoprogression, especially with immunotherapy, and also to identify different clones of tumors. And all of these um, uses are actually being used in other um, solid tumors as well. So any questions? I know that this is a topic that probably gets a lot of <laughs> um, questions in the clinic. To just randomly um, sit here and wait. <laughs> and Melissa, I was blocked from starting video, but now oh, I'm back on. There you are. So, Thank you for that wonderful summary. This is really an emerging area that may be of use in detecting the disease, detecting recurrence, following patients in longer term treatment, and even deciding when to stop treatment. Um, that is, I think, um, very exciting in terms of our research efforts. Um, it may allow us to compare treatments one against another in terms of their benefit in ways that we have used other uh, experimental approaches to in the past. But as I think Melissa pointed out, it's important to note that this is not yet a standard of care. It's being investigated. It's something which we'll hope to bring into play. But um, as we've always tried to bring to our patients, caregivers and supporters, what's new on the cusp, this is certainly one of those factors.